<laughs> We've been worshiping God, haven't we? We've been magnifying the Lord. And the Bible says that in the presence of the Lord, there's freedom, there's liberty. You know, and I, I realize that some of you, you've been through some difficult times in the past days, past weeks, past months. Just right now, in the presence of the Lord, if there's any anxiety, any worry, any doubt about tomorrow, any fear for your family, Anything going on right now that just is, you know, that screaming voice on the inside right now, just close your eyes, just submit it to God. First Peter says, cast all your care upon the Lord. Father, we just cast the anxiety on you. Jesus, you took all of our fears, our worries, all of the anxiety, Lord, all of the depression, the worry about tomorrow, the what ifs, the whatabouts, the financial worries, the health concerns. We just bring it all to you, Jesus. We lay it down at the cross in the presence of the Lord. There's joy. We receive your joy now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You know, the Lord, he's amazing, and he can do spiritual surgery in just a few moments. Isn't that good? I love the, the book of Hebrews. It says that God's word is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide piercing between the joint and the marrow and between even the soul and the spirit. That's how sharp, accurate, and perfect God's word is. Talk about an amazing surgeon God is. So if we have any depression, sorrow, worry, we can just quickly bring it to the Lord, lay it down, cast it aside, and get moving forward with God's joy. You know, God's got a plan for your life. God knows what he's doing. You are important to God. You know, we magnify the Lord when we're worshiping God. We're giving glory to God. But as we're doing that, I hope you realize in the presence of God, I hope as you're magnifying the Lord, at the same time, you're looking into the faultless law of liberty, God's word, and you're realizing God made me for a reason. God had made you for a purpose. God's got a plan for your life. He knows what he's doing. So we can submit to the author, the, the author of our faith, right? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We can submit to God. He's a good God. I can tell you're excited about it. I am too. I really am. So we got an upcoming series. You heard about it. Pastor Mike, I'm so thankful for Pastor Mike. He's been such a blessing to this church. He's been such a blessing to me and Pam and all of you. And I'm just so thankful for him. Every once in a while, he'll drop some of his wisdom in my life about, you know, agricultural wisdom. He's a genius in that area. And sometimes I've, got, I've learned expressions. You know, if somebody starts kind of, um, you know, getting in my, my realm, I know all that I have to say. I just say, hey, don't cut my grass. I got, I got all these cool kind of Mike-isms now, I call them. <laughs> but coming up, the series in September, launching September 13th, is going to be Back to the Basics, Wisdomology 101. I love it. It's going to be all about the principles of God's Word applied to our life in a very practical way. I love the book of Proverbs. I think you're going to totally love this series. Young and old, this is for you. And it goes and it dovetails so nicely together with the launch of our life groups, which are amazing, run by the, the most amazing Miss Michelle Ross. She's incredible. I got to meet her husband yesterday. What a phenomenal family. And you know, I just believe this church has some wonderful, um, uh, wise mentors, and we have some great potential protégés, and we're just bringing them all together. You know, no matter where you are in life, we all need wisdom. We all need God's mentors in our life, and this church has just some of the best, I believe, of the best. So just be prepared. You can be doing that live and in person in these life groups, or we also have options where you can do it online, virtually. You know, talk about social distancing. You can be in a life group with somebody from North Bay to Sault Ste. Marie. So you want to join up. You want to sign up. You can do that on 
allnationschurch.ca. Go in there and you can see Michelle's picture under life groups and you can just say, hey, I want to be a part of that. We're going to continue our series today on ultimate living. Ultimate living part five. This is going to be kind of a wrap up of one, two, three, four. This part five, we're going to get really practical today. And I call this seed time and harvest. You have to know seed time and harvest if you're going to live the ultimate life. If you're going to be experiencing ultimate living, You've got to know about seed time and harvest. So I'm going to get a little agricultural here the best I can with what I've learned in the past, you know, short months. But listen to this. There was a couple, an older couple. They were a farmer couple, and they were, they were having some marital problems and some difficulties. And one day, the wife walked into the house with a chicken under her arm. She's got a chicken under her arm, and she said, You see the pig I was talking about? And the old farmer looked at the wife, and he goes, that ain't no pig. He said, that's a chicken. She said, I was talking to the chicken. <laughs> now, see, that, see now, that's an example of what I'm talking about. That's not ultimate living. That's not an ultimate marriage. That's not the way to go. So that's an example of what we don't want here, right? Last week when we were talking about part four, we were talking about realigning to the truth about the axiom get to give. It's not give to get. It's get to give. That's the cycle, but it's the reciprocity. It's the um, spiritual ventilation, if you want, of breathing in and breathing out. Nobody just breathes in and says, oh, well, now I got life. There's a cycle. You breathe in, you breathe out, and therefore you live. You breathe properly, right? We don't want to be choosing to serve the God of that materialistic idol called mammon. He's a cruel taskmaster. He's a false, fake God. Talking about cruel taskmasters, there was a pastor. I know that's kind of a funny segue, but <laughs> there was a pastor, and he was kind of being a little bit manipulative, and he was trying to use one of his rich congregants to motivate the rest of the congregation, and the pastor in front of everybody, he said, John, you're a successful businessman. Surely you can contribute more to the building fund. I mean, in front of everybody, quite a bit of pressure. So John kind of looked around a little bit apprehensively, and finally he stood up and he said, look, look. He says, my, my mother's in a nursing home. He says, my daughter just lost her job. My son's starting to go to college. And he said, if I can say no to them, you can be sure I can say no to you too. <laughs> you see... Ultimate, I say ultimate living is about giving, but it's about cheerful giving. Let me quantify the giving. It's cheerful giving, right? I like 2 Corinthians 9. God says in verse uh, 7, he says, God loves a cheerful giver, not, not somebody that feels pressured, not somebody that feels like they're being coerced or they're being, um, you know, being pressured to give, but somebody that's cheerfully giving. So that's what we're talking about today, spiritually ventilating the cycle of breathing in and out the cycle of being able to get and to give, to receive and to give. John Maxwell said it so good when he said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I love that. And in my experience in ministry, there are top, two top requests that come in for prayer. Number one is health, healing, and number two is finances. Those are the two top requests over the decades, over probably the centuries for prayer. Could you pray? If there's a could you pray, those are the two top needs in life. And you know, ultimate living is about meeting those needs and seeing God's influence in our, air, our life in every area. So in part five, I wanna tie all these components together for the last four parts of the series and express through ultimate living the practical applications of this. Seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest, you can't get more practical than seed time and harvest. And you have to ask yourself, is God the top priority in my life? Is God really the top priority in my home? Well, listen, harvests don't lie. Seed time and harvest, you can actually measure the outcome. In the spiritual realm, there are measurables, and you can actually gauge where you're at by using the seed time and harvest ruler. In this world, getting is the beginning, but harvest is the outcome. You see, your divine design responds to and longs for the complete cycle of life, even your physical body. Everybody who breathes in 
has a natural instinct to want to breathe out before you breathe in again. I, I tried it at home, this experiment, and I breathe in, and just after a while, I got to just exhale. Everybody wants it, and physically is but just a mirror of the way we are spiritually designed. Your divine design responds to that cycle, proving once again that ultimate living is binary. It's seed time and harvest. It's sowing and reaping. Nobody just breathes in. Everybody wants to breathe in and then breathe out. You know, getting a guitar doesn't make you a guitar player. Even though I've seen people try that, it's never pretty. Getting a race car doesn't make you a race car driver. Speaking right now subtly to our, our life group director, Michelle Ross, she got a new electric guitar, electric car, sorry, guitar, electric car, and for some reason she thinks she's now a race car driver. <laughs> Getting all the gold does not make you a rich, prosperous person. Getting rid of the sickness does not make you a healthy person. The true art of getting is in your understanding of giving. Give to live. See, that's ultimate living. Yes, giving is an art. It requires application, training, understanding, and accuracy. So seed time and harvest is, in essence, the art, the art of the cycle of giving. There's a Bible principle to giving, and that has an agricultural origin. There's an order to getting a carrot. Did you know? I don't know that much about agriculture, but there's an order to getting a carrot. You don't start with the carrot, you start with the seed. You gotta take the seed, and then you have to actually place the seed in the right ground. If you take the carrot seed and place it on asphalt, or you place it on concrete, even I know you're not gonna get a carrot. You have to have the seed, but then you have to release, release the seed you know there's times in life when God places something in your hand and if you're in a get mode you can forget that that's not your harvest if God the Bible says God gives seed to the sower and multiplies the seed sown so there's times when you have a desire in your heart and you're praying for something and God will put a seed in your hand and I've seen people make this mistake many times they're praying for carrots and God puts a carrot seed in their hand and then they make the mistake of eating the seed instead of realizing God God's giving you the seed. Now release the seed into the right ground, right ground, and then you wait for time, and then you get carrots. See, this is so, I know it's so simple, but this whole principle applies to the kingdom of God. In Matthew 6, when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, he was talking about seeking first the kingdom of God, God's way of doing things and being right. God uses, listen to this, God Almighty uses seed time and harvest. God said he wants a family. Think about it. Right now, just in this, right now where we are, just look around, whether you're at home with your family on the couch or right here in this room, God wants a family. What's he do? He sows a son, his only begotten son, into the ground. They buried Jesus, and then God reaps a harvest of a whole family across the globe, across generations. Isn't that amazing? God uses the principle of seed time and harvest. So the right seed in the right ground. So let's hit the Bible principle on seed time and harvest, the binary principle of ultimate living. Let me just give you some principle truth here. Genesis 8, um, 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Did you see that? Seed time and harvest isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. It's not an Old Testament principle. Ask any farmer, ask any rancher. Seed time and harvest is still alive today. Now, we've kind of got into a little bit of a microwave theology because we want everything so fast, but the truth is seed time and harvest is still active today. Now, couple that truth with the New Testament reference of seed time and harvest. We go to Galatians 6, verse 7. Don't be deceived, the Bible says. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. How about this? Whatever she sows, that and that only is what she will reap. Whatever the little child sows, that and that only is what they will reap. Whatever a culture sows, whatever a church sows, that and that only is what they will reap. 
See, this is a law that's even in the New Testament. And look at how it starts out. It says, do not be deceived. Did you know your enemy needs you to believe that seed time and harvest is antiquated, that it's past, that it, it just somehow is it's not justifiable today, that we can bypass, we can sow seeds of wrong and reap a harvest that's, that's beautiful, that we can sow the wrong thing and reap the right thing. And the enemy needs us to believe that because he knows God has given you dominion and authority. So if he can get you to misuse your dominion and authority, you end up sowing the wrong seeds because you disbelieve what God's word says. And look at God said, don't be deceived. Why would he preface that truth with don't be deceived? Because the enemy is working overtime to deceive you and me about seed time and harvest. He wants us to think we can sow anything today and then we can just kind of like a lottery reap anything that we want tomorrow. It's not in the book. Comforting sweet lies make for uncomfortable, bitter realities. When we hear or see someone but we don't understand it, we are tempted to in invent our own bias. Then instead of submitting to correction, because correction is a good thing. Remember we talked about in Galatians that correction are, is for the sons and daughters. That's how you know you're a son and a daughter of God. You get corrected. And it says if we are submitting to correction, we participate when we try to substitute for correction, then we participate in pursuing confirmation bias. That becomes a distortion of your evidence-based decision-making power. What's that mean? It means the same thing. It means that you can sow one seed and somehow reap another crop. Your beliefs must stand up to critical thinking. They gotta stand up to the tough questions or at least a Dr. Phil question, right? Dr. Phil, what's he say? He says, so, how's that working for you? Right? What he's basically saying is, you're sowing this and you're reaping this. So how's that working for you? People need to realize this is an ancient law and it is a current law today. And it will be a spiritual law tomorrow. It's in place. It's not going anywhere. If God uses it, we need to use it. So let's look at how this works practically speaking. In getting and giving, we must understand that God's principle is his law of reciprocity. Remember, God's not mocked in this whole thing. God said, in this he's not mocked. And we, you and I know every day there's people out there mocking God. But in Galatians 6, 7, God says, I'm not mocked. What a man sows, what a woman sows, that is what they will reap. Boom. So let me ask you a simple question. If you sow corn, are you going to get carrots? If you sow corn, are you going to get biscuits? No, no, if you... See, like, again, this is simple because I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a very beginner farmer here. If we sow corn, we're going to get corn. That's bottom line. If you sow weeds and thorns, are you going to have a beautiful lawn? No, you're going to have weeds and thorns. If you sow trouble, do you think that you're going to get a harvest of blessing and beauty? No. You're not going, and just listen, there's people that are self-deceived. They think they can sow criticism, slander, all kinds of things, and that they can somehow walk into fields of beauty and blessing. Well, I'm under God's law of grace. You know, grace is an empowerment to prosper. So when grace hit, what it, you know what it does? It multiplies everything that you're sowing. And so people don't realize that God's grace is actually even working against them in this law because the thing is they're being disrespectful of God's law and what they're sowing is getting amplified, right? If you sow a bunch of hurt and destruction, do you think that you're going to reap a bunch of health and healing? No, 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 no. So let's apply this to pursue a particular harvest because we want a desired harvest. Do you want to have good friends? See, I, I, I talk to people that they're lonely. They want friends. Do you want good friends? You need to sow friendship into good ground. Now, remember, Proverbs 13 says, if you walk with wise men, you will be wise. But if you walk with fools, you'll be destroyed. So you can't, you got to sow friendship into the right ground. But if you want friends, you need to show yourself to be a friend and to be friendly. Do you want to have success? Whether you're a hockey player or whether you're a businessman, do you want to have success? Well, then you need to help somebody else succeed. You need to invest in them. 
If you're a 15-year-old hockey player and you want to be better, you need to start helping some seven-year-old hockey players. That's how you do it. You sow into other people's lives. If you're a great businessman, but you want to move the quotient up another notch, you need to help other younger businessmen, businesswomen. Do you want to overcome loneliness? We talked about this. Um, do, you, do you want help? Look, I'm amazed here at All Nations Church. We've got people showing up here. They don't need any fanfare or anything on a Monday morning, and they're cleaning the floors. They're cleaning the toilets. They are helping you and me, and we don't even know they're helping us. We, we might not even recognize their face, but they're helping us. They're sowing help, and I'm believing God that God is in turn helping them and blessing them. Isn't that awesome? Do for others, Matthew 7 says, do for others what you want God to do for you. People want position. So here's what you have to do. You have to, when you sow competence, then you reap a harvest of credibility. Then you turn around and you sow the credibility and then you reap a harvest of influence. Can I give that to you one more time? When you sow competence, you reap a harvest of credibility. When you sow your credibility in the right ground, then you reap a harvest of influence. That's how you lead. Some people think leadership is just telling other people what to do. Sue, I just need you to go here and do that. That's not true leadership. True leadership is influence. It's empowerment. When we empower one another, that's true leadership. Do you want to get healed? Hmm, that's an interesting one right there. Well, if you want to get healed, have you ever prayed for the sick? Have you ever prayed for somebody else to get well? You're sowing seeds. Healing has faith seeds. Matthew 21, 21, Jesus answered them and he said, Truly I tell you, if you have faith, a firm relying trust, and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. You see, your words are representative of the content of your heart, either trust or disbelief. Can I say that again? Your words are representative of the content of your heart. Jesus said this, a good man or a good woman of the good treasure of their heart brings forth good things. Your words represent the content of your heart for good or evil, faith or fear. You know, people, people don't realize how faithful they are, how much in faith they are until you begin to explain to them, even here in this horizontal earth where we're, we operate so much on the horizontal as opposed to vertical, when you go into a restaurant, let me just talk to you about faith here in your words, okay? When you go into a restaurant, you're sitting there with your friend, and you, the waitress comes up and takes your order, and you say, um, what would you like? And I'm like, you know, I'm going to have the chicken today. I'll get the chicken. He's not paying attention, and he's like, she asks him, what are you going to get? And he says, I'm going to get the hamburger. Okay, waitress walks away. All of a sudden, he kind of is like, um, hey, Stephen. He said, what did you get? That, you notice the question? We've all been there, right? And he says this, what did you get? Well, this is what I say. I got the chicken. I said, what did you get? And he goes, I got the hamburger. Now, look with me at the table. There's nothing on the table. There's no hamburger in front of him. Is he delusional? I, I just told him I got chicken. There's no chicken in front of me. See, what happened was, it's by faith. We placed an order with our words for the desire of our heart. I wanted chicken. I said to the waitress, I want chicken. I gave the order. That was my words. Can carry the desire of my heart. I got chicken. She walks away, and we're both saying to each other, what did you get? Past tense. And I'm like, I got the chicken. He said, well, I got the hamburger, but nothing's on our table. And so I'm thinking, are we both really like out to lunch? Well, we are out to lunch. <laughs> but I think you know what I'm saying here. I'm saying like, what is... Are we having, like, are we delusional? We're both talking about something that's not even on the table, but here's the deal. You and I know what we're saying. We've put faith and confidence in the integrity of the restaurant. Personally, I think that's dangerous, but we've put faith and confidence in the integrity of the restaurant that when I place an order based on what's on their menu, and I said, I want that, and I placed an order based on the integrity of the restaurant, I'm believing that somehow food's going to be on my table. So when he said, what did you get? I said, I got the chicken. Why can't we 
put more confidence in the integrity of God Almighty. And when we look at the menu of God's blessings and God says, what would you like? And I said, in my heart, I desire healing. And then somebody comes to me and they said, Pastor Stephen, what's happening in your life? And I said, I ordered healing. I'm healed. And they're like, well, you're weird. You're still hobbling around on one leg. No, no, you see, it's not on the table, but I placed the order based on the integrity of the one running the restaurant, the menu. I'm going to get what I said I would get. But see, because we totally put all this confidence laterally and we put zero confidence vertically in God, then all of a sudden we're like, well, that's strange. That's strange that he would pray that way. It's not strange. It's strange to the world. But in the kingdom of God, it's, it's agricultural. It's seed time and harvest. Amen. So just like words are representative, money is representative. See, your words represent your heart, but your money represents the content of your heart. This conversation gets so basic when we talk about the lowest form of currency on earth, which is money. See, that's the lowest form. You know, one of the highest forms of currency is time. You know, the Bible says a good name is to be chosen above silver and gold. Did you know a good name is a higher currency than silver and gold? This is what the Bible says. So this conversation gets so interesting when we talk about the currency of money. And Jesus talked about money a lot. And here's why I believe. Because it's such an easy currency to trace, to measure, to track, and to figure out. Because we deal in currency all the time. So then when we translate it, we can kind of think Jesus would say, you know, this is the way the kingdom of God operates. And then he would talk about, talk about a transaction. So let's you and I do a little bit of this. Because if someone's talking about this in this context, they might say, well, Pastor Stephen, if I can sow anything and then reap anything, can I sow money and get a harvest? Well, here's something you need to understand and you need to wrap your head around. Money is currency. It's representative. So when you're putting money any place, it represents your heart. It's, it, yes, it represents the treasury of the country that the money's you know, written on and it's written out to, but it's representative of your heart. Let me show you what I mean by that. See, your, represents, your money represents your power of choice. It represents your beliefs, your fears, your love. It represents your priorities. Your money represents your faith and it also represents your doubts. Your money represents your addictions and your virtues. If you're addicted to cupcakes, I guarantee you that money's gonna go out of your hand for some cupcake, right? Some cupcake exchange, right? Now I'm, now I'm not preaching against cupcakes. Everybody knows the Lord loves a good gluten-free cupcake. Everybody should know that, right? But one, let's, let's say if we're talking about a few people with a $100 bill. One person's money is her love for her children and her desire to feed them. Another person's money is a bribe and an opportunity to be dishonest, to beat the other person. Another person's money is a decision to be unfaithful, immoral, possibly even feed a pornography addiction. The next person uses their money to express thanksgiving to God and his gratefulness for all of his blessings. Another person hides their money. They hoard their money. You know, there's been people that have passed away and they seem like they're living like in this poverty-stricken state. And when they go in their little one-bedroom shanty, they find under the mattress just stacks and stacks of cash. Because in their belief system, they breathed in and they didn't realize they had to keep breathing out. They didn't understand reciprocity, reciprocity the cycle of life. Someone else invests in toys for underprivileged kids at Christmas just because of the love in their heart. Each person's currency is basically a representation of the content of their heart. Now, does God see the $100 bill? To a varying degree, but more than anything, he sees the content of your heart and what the $100 bill represents. Because even in a church, you can have two people giving a $100 bill and both of them are saying something completely different. God sees the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, God sees the heart. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 44 and 45. He said, for each tree is known and identified by its fruit. For figs are not picked from the thorn bushes, nor is a cluster of grapes picked from a briar bush. 
It's exactly what we've been talking about. But the good man produces what is good and honorable and moral out of the good treasure in his heart, and the evil man produces what is wicked and depraved out of the evil place in his heart, for his mouth speaks. When we say speak, can you hear that word? The mouth orders, the mouth speaks, the mouth seeds the overflow of his heart. When your words come out, it's, the con- it's encapsulating the content of your heart. So let's try with something that's as basic as acorn. I went to my friend's place here and I finangled a little acorn. If you're having trouble seeing that, that's even better. Because what I want to show you is that it's small, it's tiny, it's just a little seed. So let's go down through some acorn theology. The acorn is quite a simple little fellow. He's made up of three parts. He's got an outer, harder shell. Inside, he's got a little kernel. And then inside of that, there's what they call the embryo. Did you know basically the acorn is an embryotic tree to be all wrapped up in a hard little shell? Isn't that cool? Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this. He said, the creation of 1,000 forests is in the acorn. Can you see that? You see, some of us are seeing just a tiny little minuscule nothing, but people who are in the lumber business, they're seeing a future forest. They're seeing commodity. They're seeing the potential of many, many jobs. Can you see what I'm saying? It all depends on your perspective, how well you can see. So consider how a forest of oak trees is born out of this tiny little dream, this small little beginning. As you well know, Nothing great can happen from this seed. This, the destiny of the seed remains dormant, latent, until, until we work the principle of seed time and harvest. So let me give you the three principles of seed time and harvest. Number one is humility. Number two is death. And number three is resurrection. Now that may sound like a heavy to you, but the thing is, if you try to bypass it, let's say, let's say for example, this little nut tries to bypass the very beginning stages of humility and death and just says, I just want to be resurrected. I just want to be exalted. I just want to be put in a high place. The only way this little guy is going to get to the top of the tree is if maybe some squirrel finds him, pulls him up to the top of the tree, puts him in his little nest, and you know what's going to happen. He thought he got a promotion. He's going to become squirrel trail mix, right? And then we even know that's not even over. Eventually, he's just going to become squirrel poop. Isn't that right? So we have to honor the principle of seed time and harvest for this little guy to go anywhere. So number one, humility. As long as this seed is kept or held at an elevated state, its future is stalled, latent, undiscovered. 1 Peter 5, 6. I love this scripture. Therefore, humble yourself, little nut. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Oh my goodness, Pastor Stephen, did you actually say that God wants to exalt me? See, it's so easy to get. We don't realize how many word um, aversions we have. The moment you, re- you read this word, and if you got a word aversion to God promoting you or exalting you, right away you're like, oh, that, that can't be Christian. But you see, as God promotes you, As God blesses you, you gain more influence and you can help more people. As God blesses this little nut, and if God can, if he will submit and humble himself and God can have a chance to have his law of reciprocity work in this little nut's life, he can become a forest and be a blessing to many, many squirrels, right? Number two, death. Nothing happens to the future of this little nut if this little guy doesn't lay in the ground, get buried, and cease to be. See, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we read the word, well, you know, Pastor Stephen, you know, the Bible says I got to die to myself. And they use that tone. Wrong tone. That's not a Jesus tone. You don't have to die to yourself. You get to cease to exist to yourself, to what you were, the brokenness, my sinful nature, my sick nature, my distorted nature, I get to cease to exist to my old ways, my old habits, my brokenness, my failure, my immorality, my dysfunction, my dysphoria. I get to cease to exist to all that stuff. 
That's when we say part of humble yourself, then we need to die into the ground and then look at what happens. Number three, resurrection. Just like Jesus. The Bible says Jesus humbled himself to go to the cross. He didn't stop there. He died on the cross. The Bible says that he was taken from the cross and they buried Jesus. He went into the ground. And then on the third day, what? He rose up. And when he rose up, my friend, you and I came with him. Thousands of years of generations of broken lives were resurrected in the resurrected Savior, Jesus. God uses the principle of seed time and harvest. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus was speaking to Martha and he said this in John eleven twenty five 25 to 26. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me as Savior will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in him, in me, will never die. Do you believe this? Think of what he was saying. He said, those who die will never die. And you're like, well, what, what, what kind of double speak is this? What kind of strange speak is this? I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will, even if he dies, will never die. Because when we die to ourself, who wants to hold on to our old broken? It's like a snake skin, like a snake shedding its skin. Who, what snake would want to hold on to that old skin, that old restrictive, tight skin. As you're growing, you gotta let go of the layers of yesterday. You know, some people think, oh, I want everything that God has for me. But they refuse to cease to exist to the way it was. You know, we get so hooked up and in love with the past. Well, that's not the way we did it before. Well, that's not the way our family does it. We don't have Thanksgiving like that. We don't do Christmas like that. I don't understand. God's trying to give you new life. He's trying to make you a new creature. Imagine a butterfly coming out of the caterpillar, out of that cocoon, still wanting to hold on to its caterpillarness, and at the same time, too, being a butterfly. It's impossible. You have to let go, you have to cease to exist, die to what you were, to be reborn into what you can be through Christ. Humility to death to resurrection. And Jesus said this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, reborn, renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the old broken stuff is passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. My friend, because of what Christ has done on the cross, we are no longer slaves to sin. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, the old things, the old brokenness is passed away. There's no such thing as ultimate living without being vitally united to Christ, to Christ's death, which we're about to celebrate here in just a moment. See, we celebrate communion. We celebrate his death because we get access to Jesus' humility and his death. I don't have to go to the cross. I get his cross. By association, I believe in his death. I get his death and his resurrection, but we're gonna take communion and we get to celebrate his death. What's that mean to me? That means I cease to exist to the brokenness of my life, the dysphoria of my life, and I get access to his resurrection, but you can't just have the one. You can't just have the breathing in and think you're living life. We gotta be receivers, but we have to be givers. Pastor Stephen, how do I receive that? How do I get that? Do you realize so many times in life we talk about, in the church, Jesus' hands being pierced. We talk about his feet being pierced. We talk about his side being pierced. But did you know King Jesus, his lungs were crushed on the cross? The Roman crucifix was designed to suffocate a man, a woman. It was designed to put extreme pressure on the lungs from the diaphragm with all of your weight hanging on your diaphragm. It would literally crush your lungs. So when you tried to breathe in, it became so difficult to cycle the air in 
and it became unbelievably painful to breathe out because to breathe out, he had to pull on the nails and push down on his feet with the nails and the pain was excruciating. And he would have to do that to get the cycle. What I want you to understand is when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price to get me and you back our ventilation. We are spiritually ventilating, vent, ventilating dead. Our, our, the in and out has been lost in our life until we come to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't just get us the receive back. He gets us the empowerment to give back. He paid an amazing price at the cross, which we're about to celebrate right now. When he did that, he paid the price for Stephen Marshall's ventilation spiritually that I might not only receive from heaven, but that I might be a conduit of heaven here on earth and give, breathing out. You might say, Pastor Stephen, I want to receive Jesus. I, I've got to. Everything that he did for me on the cross, I want it. Look, just bow your head right now. You might be driving down the road, listening to KFM, wherever you are, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, you're the way, the truth, and the life. You died on the cross for me. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I give you all of me for all of you. Thank you for saving me, making me a child of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now let's do this. Let's, let's take communion together. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, um, whether you're watching us on Facebook Live, whether you're here in the room, no matter where you are listening to KFM, I want to encourage you, go to the website. There's a button on our website we've made just prominent. It's right there. It's the Jesus button. Hit the Jesus button because I want to hear from you. Get your name and your email in there. And if you get any prayer requests, we've got amazing people in this church that have great faith and they know how to order off of God's menu. And they want to connect their faith with your faith and pray for you. So please do that. Hit the Jesus button and just fill out the information. Even your birthday. I want to know what your birthday is so we can send something to you on your birthday. Just something just to let you know that we're thinking about you and praying for you. You're a part of the family of God, and I believe that you're part of the family here at All Nations Church. That means that you get to take communion with us. I want you receiving communion with us. And here's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, it says, I received from the Lord himself that which I passed unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And look at what he does. When he had given thanks for the bread, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Think about Christ's suffering on the cross, his body being crushed, his lungs being crushed for you and me. And here's what he says to you and me. He said, would, would you just believe what I did for you and take this bread with me? Would you associate with me? Let's do that. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Master, we thank you. You're so good, Lord. I just never get tired of thinking about all the things that you've accomplished for us, Jesus. Then he goes on, verse 25, and it says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant ratified, established in my blood. You know what that means? That means it's done. Like this is a settled issue. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Talk about ultimate living. The master modeled ultimate giving when he shed his blood. They didn't just stop at emptying a little bit of blood out of his veins. They emptied the entire vessel of our Lord and Savior Jesus on the cross every day drop of his blood. Even the centurion, the soldier who was so used to seeing people die crucified, he marveled. When he saw the last breath come out of our Savior, he said, surely this is the Son of God. 
He was amazed. A man who saw thousands of people executed was in awe of the way King Jesus emptied his vessel, every drop of blood for you and me. It's ratified. It's established. It's done. So in honor of King Jesus, let's drink the cup today. Jesus, I just thank you for your broken body and for your shed blood. And right now, Lord, in the sound of my voice, Father, I just pray that anybody that's sick in their body, Lord, that they would just hear from the word of God. 1 Peter 2, 24, by Jesus' stripes, you were healed. By Jesus' stripes, I said, you were healed. And Heavenly Father, let it resonate from the utmost realms of heaven to the depths of earth right now. That, Lord, your family, your children, your sons and daughters might be loosed and set free from every infirmity, from every disease, from every sickness. Father, we thank you for the doctors, for the nurses. We thank you for the surgeons. We thank you for the medical community that we have, Lord, that invests in humanity to save lives. But we need more. We need the great physician, God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who holds the blueprint for every body, every physical design in this room. Father, we need your um, intercession right now. So we lay a hold of what you said was already accomplished through the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, and we receive healing on behalf of the family of God. And Father, may you get all the glory in the precious name of Jesus. And we all say... Amen. So listen to this. I want to just speak a blessing over you as you go into this week, and I pray that you just believe and receive all the benefits that God has in his word for your life. And here's what the Lord has directed us to speak over you. I say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his beautiful face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. God bless you.